Hello, and welcome back to this week's episode of Bites of History with Irene Walton. I'm your host, Irene Walton, and we are doing another Crumbs of History today. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. If you are just tuning in and this is your first ever episode of Bites of History or you haven't been around long enough to have listened to the last Crumbs of History episode, just as a quick breakdown, Crumbs of History are episodes where I take little stories about food history or just little fun tidbits or things that wouldn't really make up a full juicy meaty episode (laughs) by themselves and I put them together. It's usually like four or five little stories. So this is our third episode of Crumbs of History and we're going to have so much fun. We're talking about how forks are the devil's utensil. We're talking about if Mountain Dew actually lowers your sperm count or not. We're going to have a great time. And we're going to start right now. (laughs) I just want to take a second to share a big, big thank you to my Patreon community. I really believe I have the best community out there. Uh, Everybody who is a member from my little producers tier, which starts at just $2, to my little cooks tier, where we do a cooking class together every single month, and everybody in between, Your support means so very much to me, and I truly would not be able to do this without you. So thank you very much for making this show happen. Um, I love you guys so much, so thank you. If you guys want to check out the Patreon and become a member of our little community, you can check it out at patreon.com slash Irene Walton. I also want to say thank you to our sources, because also without them, these episodes wouldn't be possible. So... Thank you so much to ConsumerReports.org, TheVintageNews.com, FastCompany.com, History.com, Wiktionary.com, and HopkinsAllChildren.org. For our first little crumb of history, I'm going to answer a question that I know I have personally had a lot throughout the years, and it's about generic versus name brand foods. Now, when I'm saying generic, if you don't know what that means, that is a okay. A generic food or a generic product is the private label or the company label or the store label of a well-known item. So you have Lay's potato chips and then you have Kroger brand potato chips. So I've always wondered, I'm like, what is the real difference? A lot of people think that these store name brands are not as good as the like real name, nationally named brand. And they think that most often because it's less expensive. So, you know, a bag of Lay's potato chips might be $4.79, whereas a bag of Kroger brand potato chips might be $2.99. I think sometimes that is very valid. I think that some things that are at a higher price point are going to be a higher quality. That's just how life works sometimes. However, at least in my research, when it comes to grocery store products, name brand versus generic, there's something really interesting there. So many of the generic store brand, store name products are coming from the literal same exact place that the national name brand product is coming from. So what that means is I I keep thinking of potato chips. So just stick with me for this Lay's one. I don't know if that one has been confirmed, but when Lay's is doing their run of like classic original sea salt potato chips, right? They're going to do their 50 million bags. And then Kroger has already reached out to them and been like, hey, can you put some of those chips in the bags for us? We're going to sell those too. There are so many instances where it is oftentimes quite literally the same exact product going into just a store brand generic name package. There are obviously going to be exceptions to this. And those exceptions can be just completely different. Like some store brand names actually do have their own plants where they process things and make things. And so it's going to be different. So they're not reaching out to Lay's to say, hey, can you like throw our batch in there as well? They're doing their own stuff. They're making their own potato chips. And as we all know, like how many ways can you make a potato chip? It's not going to be too dissimilar, but sometimes it's not coming from the exact place. There are other instances where I I guess I really want potato chips. It's quite literally the only thing I could think of. There are some other instances. Oh, let's say, um, let's say like Oreos, right? So we're not going to be getting the exact 
same Oreo recipe because sometimes these are proprietary recipes. Sometimes they're patented, so they can't give out their recipe, but there can be little tweaks, little changes. Those little differences can happen with just a slight variation in the recipe at the national name brand plant. Sometimes again, it is at like the private label facility where they're making it. Now, there are some things that are just going to be exactly what they are. And if you have, you know, your own loyalties to a certain brand of something, great, good for you. But in a lot of the studies, because people have been wondering about this for years and years, there've been uh, there's been a lot of money and a lot of studies that have gone into this. The least notable differences in generic versus name brand items are going to be in things like flour, sugar, salt, spices, frozen vegetables, and canned beans and other canned goods. Now, if you're wondering, well, if I'm getting the exact same thing, how does it get to be cheaper? Like, there's no way that it can just like be as good if it's not as much money. And the thing is, is that these national name brands. Think about it. We know about Lay's potato chips because they've been marketing for decades and decades. They put so much money into their advertising and into their publicity and into their um, marketing and packaging. So they charge a higher price because they put more into that product, even if it's the same product. Does that make sense? Did I make sense about that at all? You know, nobody's like, oh my God, I'm really craving Kroger brand crinkle cup potato chips. You know, people are gonna be like, oh, I really want some ruffles. That's what you're paying for when you're buying Lay's versus Kroger brand. And that's fine. That's okay. Like, so, you know, there are some things where I'm like, oh, I'm gonna buy goldfish. I don't want the generic fish shaped cracker. I hate it. It's to me, it tastes like ass. But there are other things where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get Kroger brand or Target brand tinfoil because it's quite literally Reynolds wrap foil. They just don't have that packaging. There are a couple things that are absolutely confirmed. Like Reynolds is one. That's why I use that example. Like Reynolds wrap is a brand that does contract out to other stores. And uh, Hormel is another one like Hormel chili, Hormel meats and stuff. So it's just something to think about. There are, again, there are a lot of things that you could like, and it doesn't have to not be name brand. It can if you want it to be. But yeah, I just always thought that was really interesting. So I wanted to share that with you guys because I've pondered it for quite some time. It was the same as with the last crumbs of history where I was like, why can you eat raw beef and not raw chicken? It was just one of those things that I've thought about for years. So now I finally got to put it to rest. Our next little crumb of history is all about Guinness. Yes, the super dark Irish beer. I heard this little fact about Guinness and the Guinness Brewery years ago, and I just like never knew if I fully believed it. And then I did a little research on it, and it's absolutely true. The Guinness lease for the brewery that it's located in, like the one out right outside of Dublin, the like the Guinness Brewery in the headquarters, is a 9,000 year lease. Let me tell you how that happened. So in 1725, Arthur Guinness is born to his father, who is kind of like the groundskeeper for this archbishop. The archbishop's name is Arthur Price. Now, Arthur Guinness and Arthur Guinness's dad were always around, you know, they lived on this property and Arthur Price, the archbishop, really loved them so much so that when he died, he left them a good chunk of money, like a lot of money. This whole time, Arthur Guinness's dad, who was the groundskeeper, had also practiced beer making and brewing things and doing stuff like that. So he had sort of passed that love on to his son. So in 1759, with a little bit of that inheritance and a lot of brewing knowledge, after perfecting his brewing skills, Arthur Guinness moves to right outside of Dublin and finds this old abandoned brewery. It was called the St. James Gate Brewery. The owner of it, you know, told Arthur that he could absolutely rent it out for a hundred pound down payment and 45 pounds a month for rent. Now this is back in 1759, 1780, or I'm sorry, 1760. So Arthur Guinness was like, work. I love that. I'm so here for this. Actually, I love it so much. Could you make sure that I pay that for the next 9,000 years? And the owner was like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so he did. They wrote up a 9,000 year lease, which is actually still on display at the Guinness Brewery and Guinness headquarters right outside of Dublin. And it's just so cool. It's just one of those like funny little things that like 
if you didn't know, it's not going to change your life. But now that you do, anytime somebody brings up Guinness, you're going to be like, actually, did you know? Um, Funny little story about the lease. And now you have that little crumb of history. So I thought you'd like it. <laughs> okay, we have three more. I'm going to do the last one, which is so crazy. And the, these next two are just two little baby ones. So I have always heard the term small potatoes just to refer to something that is like of little value or isn't worth your time. And I was always like, oh, like, I wonder what like fun potato history this comes from. <laughs> and in reality, it's literally just because potatoes are already so inexpensive and small ones are even less expensive. So it's truly just like it, equivalent. They're like, oh, that's small potatoes. That's not really worth much, which, you know, maybe you've never want, pondered the meaning of small potatoes, but I sure have. And now there you go. The next one is, I'm sure we've all heard this, this rumor, this tall tale, this bit of folklore around Mountain Dew. And people think for some reason that Mountain Dew lowers your sperm count if you are a person with sperm. I never really paid much attention to it. I never loved Mountain Dew that much. Also, I do not produce sperm, so it was not something I was too concerned about. But apparently... People were like using it to be like, oh, this is like kind of like male birth control if I drink enough Mountain Dew. The researchers, doctors, scientists, the people at Johns Hopkins, which is an incredibly well-established medical research place, medical university, all things medicine. If you hear Johns Hopkins, you can trust it, I believe. They have made it very clear that there is absolutely no scientific proof whatsoever that Mountain Dew or any other soda for that matter lowers sperm count. Not something you should worry about. And it's also not something you should be counting on as a contraceptive. So just so you know. Now we're going to talk about what I think is the most interesting thing of this whole episode. Forks. You heard me right. No, you don't have to back up 15 seconds. We're going to be talking about forks and how they were very closely related to the devil up until only a couple hundred years ago. So let's talk about the etymology of the word fork. It comes from the Latin word furca, which means pitchfork, which was super, super associated very closely with the devil. Now, we first see forks being used in the early, early, early ancient Middle East and in the Byzantine Empire. Now, the first time that they move a little bit further west is when Princess Maria Argiropalina, Maria Argiropalina, that sounds right. That sounds right. The niece of the Byzantine emperor was married to the son of Doge of Venice in 1004 CE. She brought forks with her. She brought a lot of things with her um, from where she's from in the Byzantine Empire. And one of those things was her cutlery that she, you know, used and was used to. So she brings it to Italy, to Venice in 1004. And the first time they hold like a royal dinner, Maria takes out her fork. And this is around... All of these Venetians who were very used to eating with their hands, which back then was a very, very, very normal thing in a lot of cultures today. It's still a very normal thing. I love when I am in a situation where I can eat with my hands. It's um, It was also like a big part of eating was the ritual of washing your hands. It's like a very cleanly process. You're also, here's just a little fun fact. You're also supposed to handle like ancient, ancient books and stuff, like thousand year old books with just clean washed hands. They're one of our best utensils. So if somebody's given you grief about eating with your hands, they can go chill out. Anyway, the fork. So she brought these forks with her. And at the first royal dinner where she's in front of, you know, these new Venetians, her new people, the place that she lives, they're all eating with their hands. She takes out their fork. <gasps> Everybody's shocked. Oh, my God. What is that? It's a pitchfork. It's the devil. Oh, my God. Blah, 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 blah. So two years later, Princess Maria dies of the plague. But St. Peter was like, no. No, she died because she's the, she worked with the devil and she used the devil's utensil because she used a fork. And so then for literally 400 years, nobody used forks. They were like, I don't want to die. I'm not going to use the devil's utensil. Get out of town. So they didn't. 
It wasn't until the 15th century, which just in case you always get confused, that is the 1400s. I always get confused too. I'm like, why can't it just be the 14th century if it's the 14th? Anyway, that's my own. It's my own gripe. Uh, In the 1400s, the 15th century, we see in Italy this huge, huge craze of candied fruit come around. Now, it's not candied fruit the way that we would think about it. Like when I think candied ginger, it's like those hard little pieces coated in sugar. This is um, more kind of like a fruit cocktail almost. It's fruit that has been bathed in sugar and is in this like really syrupy sweet mixture. Now, it kept falling off of spoons and it's too cumbersome to try to pick up and grab. It's slippery. It's stained fingers. And it was very like aggressive to try to stab it with a knife and eat it. So people are like, oh, my God, like, let's bring that fork back. Like it can't be can't still be that associated with the devil. So they bring the fork back. But because forks were so hard to come by and so, you know, like had such an aggressive stigma around them. They were hard to find. So when people would end their dinner with this candied fruit, they would have to pass one fork around and wipe it off in between uh, whoever ate it last, which I thought was so crazy to imagine a world where like you're passing around a single fork. But that's what it was like. Now, after just a couple years of the fork coming back after these candy fruits got super popular, forks were actually really well accepted and also actually a sign of good manners in Italy instead of, you know, being associated with devil worship, which was a really big win for the fork. (laughs) Now, Catherine Medici left Italy to go marry Henry II of France. And with that, she brought a lot of Italian comforts with her. She brought her very beautiful clothes. She brought her cutlery and her utensils that she used. She also brought ballet and the Italian banking system to France. Then she marries Henry II. She pulls out her forks, starts using her forks, They get super popular in France as well. Now, at the time when this like Catherine Medici time, we're kind of thinking of like a two pronged fork that's sort of straight. Looks like a um, like a pasta fork, if you're familiar with that. And if you're not, it's just like a handle with like bink, bink. Looks kind of like a like an uppercase Y almost, but a little straighter. Now, throughout the years, instead of the two tines, we add a third tine so that things are less likely to fall through the cracks of the fork. Then a lot of times we'll see a fourth tine in forks. And we also start to see a curve develop so it can better uh, kind of cradle the food that you're holding with it. But I just like heard this about, I heard like rumblings about forks being associated with the devil. And I was like, I need to talk about this. I need to dive in. I need to find out what this is all about. And I'm so happy I did because I had no idea that forks were just associated with the devil. And uh, now I know where my favorite utensil comes from. Well, is it my favorite utensil? I do love a fork. I love a spoon. There's not much you can do with a spoon that you can't do with a fork, you know? That's a pod for a different day, my friends. (laughs) But that is our episode of Crumbs of History. Thank you guys so much for hanging out for just a bunch of random stuff about food that I love. I hope you loved it too. And I can't wait to take another bite out of history with you next week on Tuesday. But like, oops, but like always, I will see you on Friday for another video. I'm going to try... I'm going to try to take a stab at that cake again, that beautiful TikTok cake that I'm trying to make but messed up last week. Okay. I love you guys so much. I hope you have a great day. And uh, oh, like, comment, and subscribe down below. It means a lot to me. It's totally free. I put one of these videos out every week and I put another food video out every week as well. So two videos a week on Tuesdays and Fridays. I love you. Goodbye. Goodbye.